Today, we're going to figure out how to get professional grade photos of our miniatures. What up, mini family? Taking awesome photos of our miniatures is a skill just like painting them is. If you don't know where to start, consider checking out the video we did a couple weeks ago about beginner photography. Now that we have a basic foundation of knowledge for miniature photography, where do we go from here? Well, I believe a good next step is establishing some photography vocabulary. And the first vocab term we'll be discussing is exposure. Exposure, put simply, is the amount of light you need to photograph your miniature. Apologies for the non-defined term, but there really isn't a way to correctly expose a miniature, but there are ways to incorrectly expose a miniature. Overexposure is when your subject is too bright, and maybe parts of the photo are so bright that they're clipping. Clipping occurs when something in your scene is so bright, the camera can't tell what color it is, so it assigns it the value of pure white. There's also underexposure, which is when your picture is simply too dark. Correct exposure is somewhere in between, enough light to clearly see the miniature. The light in your scene can be defined by the types of fixtures you use to illuminate your miniature. And we discussed that last week, but more classically, the exposure of your scene is defined by three things, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Aperture is what we'll go over first. Aperture is like a gate. It's what determines how much light hits your camera sensor by either being wide open or closed down. Cameras and camera lenses represent aperture with the decimal number. The smaller the number, the more open the lens is and vice versa. Now being that aperture is a component of exposure, it affects the amount of light in our scene. A higher value corresponds to a more shut off aperture, which results in a darker image. Imagine a human eye when it's really sunny outside. You tend to squint to cut down on the amount of light making it to your eyes. Your pupils also dilate in a similar fashion to allow more light in or cut light down depending on the scenario. The aperture is like the pupils of the camera. However, adjusting aperture has another side effect. When we make changes to our aperture, we affect our depth of field. The smaller the aperture value, the more open it is, the shallower our depth of field is. This often manifests itself in a background becoming blurry. A larger value acts in much the opposite way, with the higher values often deepening our depth of field. A shallow depth of field can oftentimes bring dimension to our miniature photography by separating the foreground from the background. This is an important feature to discuss when talking about miniature photography. Oftentimes, we want the majority of our miniature to be in focus so you can see all the details. So for that reason, you'll be shooting with a very deep depth of field, which means that oftentimes the image gets darker. This can be a limiting factor of miniature photography, but we'll discuss how you can solve this in a little bit. The next vocab term will introduce a shutter speed, another component of exposure. Shutter speed determines the amount of time our camera sensor is exposed to light and is often represented in fractions of a second or seconds. Because shutter speed is a component of exposure, modifying it affects the light in our picture. If you choose a smaller value, our camera sensor is exposed to light for less time, darkening our image and vice versa. Just like with aperture, there is another side effect to adjusting shutter speed. The longer our shutter is open for, i.e. the bigger the value, the more susceptible our photos are to motion blur. When the shutter is open, the picture captures all the motion in our scene. Let's look at an example. In this photo, I have the shutter open for one second and I move the miniature through the scene. Notice how the miniature is blurry and hazy and you can see a streak of where it was and where it moved to, but everything else is fine. That's because while the camera was capturing a still image, the miniature was moving through the scene and everything else was still. So how does motion blur affect miniature photography? Well, oftentimes we're so zoomed in and the details of our models are so small that even the smallest amount of motion blur can reduce the overall sharpness of our image. Motion blur can introduce itself into your pictures when you click the shutter on your camera to take the photo. The tiny motion from clicking that button can cause the camera to move slightly and introduce that motion blur. A fix to this problem is to ensure that your miniature and camera are motionless. Use a tripod for your camera and use some kind of remote or timer on your camera to take the picture. That way everything is completely still and no motion blur will be introduced. Since miniature photography is set up this way, we can use a much longer shutter speed than normal photography which allows us more leverage when trying to expose our miniature correctly and also counterbalances the negative side effects of needing to close down our aperture. This quite nicely brings us back to good even exposure. 
The final vocab term and component of exposure we'll discuss is ISO. The higher the ISO, the higher your camera sensor sensitivity to light, and the lower the ISO, the lower the sensitivity. If you're sensing some kind of pattern with the last two elements of exposure, your instincts are spot on. There is an additional side effect to modifying ISO. ISO isn't some magic value you can crank without any repercussions. The higher the ISO, the grainier and noisier your image becomes. This becomes problematic with miniature photography because oftentimes in post we're zooming into our subject and when we enlarge the image we also enlarge the grain, making that ugliness more apparent. Feel free to increase the ISO but not so much that you get a grainy image. Let's quickly review. Aperture. Small hole, less light, deep depth of field. Large hole, more light, shallow depth of field. Shutter speed. Smaller value, less motion blur, less light. Higher value, more motion blur, more light. ISO, higher value, more light, more grain. Lower value, less light, less grain. Now that we have our basic vocabulary established, let's move on to tools. In addition to what we discussed in the beginner photography video, you need a respectable amount of quality light. The more light we have within reason makes it easier to expose our image without needing to adjust any of the parameters to unoptimal settings. Quality light was defined in last week's video, so if you need more info on that, check out that video. After light comes a camera of some kind. For professional miniature photography, a DSLR or a similarly sophisticated camera is preferred but not necessary. Larger DSLRs oftentimes have manual control over the Terms we just discussed, shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. Oftentimes, they also have the ability to interchange lenses, giving us more options, picking out macro lenses, or zoom lenses, or prime lenses. And finally, larger, more expensive cameras have physically larger sensors. And what this means is that we can get a more shallow depth of field, giving us the ability to distinguish our miniature from the background even better. The next tool to discuss is some kind of diffusion. Remember last photography video when I bashed light boxes? Well, this is where they come into play. A sign of novice photography is when your photographs have harsh specular highlights and dark shadows, essentially high contrast. This comes from lighting a miniature with a small point source of light. Light boxes offer diffusion for our harsh lights by softening it and making the apparent light source much larger. You don't need a light box to diffuse light. You can use fabric you find at a fabric store, a shower curtain, or even a garbage can. Just keep in mind that the larger the apparent light source, the softer the highlights and the shadows are going to be. Simply stuffing your lamp with diffusive material isn't going to help much, but draping a nice diffusive material in front of your lamp would help a lot more. Another item that could be valuable to people who have interchangeable lenses is a macro lens. Macro lenses have very short focal ranges and allow us to get in close to see all the nitty gritty detail of our miniatures. The next tool we'll need is some kind of software to edit our photos. Options like Adobe Lightroom, Photoshop, Elements, and GIMP are all great options. I tend to prefer Adobe Lightroom. Finally, to review from last week's episode, you'll need something to stabilize the camera like a tripod, which exists for both larger cameras and cell phones, and also a backdrop of some kind. A piece of paper or something you create in Photoshop is a fine option. Now that we understand the terms and tools of miniature photography, let's talk about camera settings. This section is going to be a little generic since we all have different cameras, but there are some basic rules we can lay down. Let's touch on picture profiles. Picture profiles impart an aesthetic onto our photographs, and in miniature photography we want our photos to look as natural as possible. Try to find a picture profile that implies a natural or standard look. We want to highlight the painter's talent, not necessarily the photographer's. After this, let's dial in our white balance. The first way is by color temperature. If you know the color temperature of your bulbs, feel free to set your white balance to the exact temperature of those bulbs. Another excellent way is by setting a custom white balance by taking a photo of a gray card in the exact lighting situation as your model. You then use this information in the photo to set your white balance. Next is to make sure we're shooting in a raw format. If your camera doesn't have this option, it's okay. It's simply a nice to have. A raw image format gives us more leverage in post to make adjustments if needed. If you properly expose your photo, you shouldn't really need to worry about this. Next is our exposure settings. 
It's impossible for me to give you specific values to use because it depends entirely on the amount of light you use, but I can give you general rules of thumb. You generally want your aperture to be a higher value, more closed down, which then in turn means you want to increase your shutter speed to counteract how closing down our aperture darkens our image. To review, we want to close down our aperture to ensure that the majority of your model is in focus. Stop this down as much as you need until this is accomplished, but don't go all the way to maximum. Maximum closed down aperture can oftentimes impart some kind of softness on our image. Your ISO can then be your mediator. If you need the image to be brighter, turn the ISO up. If you notice that you start to get grain, turn the ISO back down again. And consider opening your aperture some more to let some more light in. It really is a balancing act. You fine tune your settings to your lighting situation. The more light you have, the more ability you have to expose correctly without needing to unoptimally change any of your settings. Another good trick to avoid having shallow depth of field is to position our model so it occupies less Z space. This means that with your shallow depth of field, you can get the entire model in focus as opposed to only a portion of it by simply rotating the model. Finally, while this isn't necessarily a setting, let's talk about framing. Since the majority of our cameras are taking very high resolution photos, let's pull back from the miniature to take our photo with the intention of zooming in in post. The reason we want to take a step back from our miniature is to eliminate or reduce the magnification effect that happens when we're too close to our miniature, which we'll discuss right now. Sorry to spring another vocab term on you so late in the game, but its relevance to framing is important. Simply put, the closer you are to your miniature, the greater the degree of magnification and also the shallower the depth of field. Whoa, wait a second. I thought aperture affected depth of field. Well, it does, and so does magnification. In order to get all of our miniatures in focus, we not only need to close down on our aperture, but we need to physically step back from our miniature, increasing the distance between the lens and the model to reduce the magnification effect of our camera. I can hear all the questions buzzing around in your guys' heads. So let's try to address one right now. Earlier in the video, I said that getting a macro lens was advantageous because you could get in close to your miniature and see all that nice detail. But right now, I just said that stepping back when taking a picture of a miniature is good. So which is it? The answer is, of course, it depends. If you're taking a full body shot of a 28 millimeter model, it's probably best to not use a macro lens and step further away from the miniature so you can get the entirety of the miniature in focus. But if you wanna get in and take a picture of a specific bit of the miniature, like a weapon or a gem or a face, a macro lens will serve you well here. My advice when looking to pick out lenses is first get a non-macro lens, maybe one with a lower focal range. My Panasonic 12 to 35 has a much lower focal range than my Canon 50 millimeter lens. If you decide that this lens isn't doing it for you, consider then getting a macro lens, but only then. We got our settings ready, we got our tools in place, and we have our picture framed perfectly. Finally, we need to place our lights. Ideally, you will have two or more lights. Place the two lights on either side of your miniature in front of the model, creating a 45 degree angle with the position of the light, the mini, and the surface it's sitting on. It's now time to take the picture. Either use a remote app to take the photo or set a timer on your camera and fire off that picture. What should be our result is a crisp, nicely exposed image, which may or may not need some cropping. So let's get to it. The remainder of this tutorial will take place in Adobe Lightroom, but any photo editor should be able to make these adjustments. The first thing I like to do is get my framing right by cropping in and adjusting the rotation to my liking. Next, I work on exposure if needed. Provided you got the correct exposure, you shouldn't need to modify any of the shadow or highlight values, but in this stage, if you feel like your image is too dark or too bright, you can lift it with the exposure control. Or you can be more selective and lower the highlights if you feel like they're too harsh and similar to the shadows. I'd be careful about specifically lifting the shadows because oftentimes digital photography likes to hide all of its noise in the shadows and bringing up the shadows to a brighter value can oftentimes bring out that nasty grain. At this stage, I avoid anything that'll make my miniature look different than in real life, such as saturation, vibrancy, or a lot of contrast. 
Remember, we want our picture to look natural. That means that if your photo came out less contrasted in real life, which is a total possibility, bump it up until it's accurate. Finally, add a little sharpening, but be careful. If your image is too sharp, it can bring out the noise from the ISO or make the edges of your model look weird. Lastly, if needed, we can add a little noise reduction. We're done. Watermark and export that puppy and you should have an awesome picture that demonstrates not only your amazing ability at painting, but also photography. I realize that there may be a ton of confusion and a lot of questions that come up because of all of these various topics we discussed in this video, and that's totally fine. In the description to this video, I have compiled a list of articles and videos that discuss all of the topics in detail, magnification, ISO, aperture, exposure, all these things. So if you feel like you need a refresher on any one topic in specific, feel free to check out those resources below. If you still have questions after that, feel free to comment on this video and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Speaking of you guys, let's check out the community highlight for this week. This week we have Luis Puenta, and if that name sounds familiar, that's because he's submitted photos before. This time he's bringing in the heat with some second irregular frontiersmen from the game Infinity. These models look absolutely gorgeous. Thanks for the submission, Louise. Thanks for checking out my video. If you guys wouldn't mind, I'd appreciate it if you could share it around. I spent a long time making sure I addressed all the important advanced terms and all the scenarios people might encounter in miniature photography. I compiled a playlist of all of my videos regarding miniature photography that you can share around as a comprehensive tool for anyone to get up to speed taking awesome photos of their plastic toy soldiers. But more importantly, don't forget to paint more miniatures and take awesome photos of it afterwards. Blinded by the overconfidence of its advisors and the homunculi in his coven, he creates a plot to steal a son from a neighboring <laughs> Exposure. Boop! What am I saying? 11.30 on a work night. We got one paragraph to go. This is the negative that side effect. Come on, man, that was gonna be a good take. Videos. <sighs> that sounded so pretentious. I'm gonna be my videos. My ass hurts so much. To paint more mini chews. Mini chews? I was so close. <laughs> I was so fucking close. So many words that make me wanna be a hammer dad. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Everything's still rolling, everything's still rolling. 13 minutes. So on page two of seven generic lules, some lules, laws and rules put together. 